Hello. Welcome to Kickapoo Caverns. Warmth and the sounds of the breeze and birds dominate the surface world and its ever-changing conditions. It's so different from the cool stillness in the cave I just came from. And that's what I love about caves. It's the contrast. It's the feeling of entering another world where the sudden drop in temperature tells me I'm underground. The silence and the smells suddenly change and cause me to pay closer attention. The cave tells me to pause and put the cares of the surface world on hold. You see, it's exactly that silence and stillness underground that helps bats hibernate in a cave. In winter, bats need to stop flying and be still in order to retain every bit of stored energy so they can survive many long months when there are no insects for them to eat. Those of us who love caves and bats want to see them both protected. This is the sinkhole entrance to Wazika Cave, a small wild cave here on the Kickapoo Caverns property. This bat gate protects the cave and the bats that hibernate in it each winter. The openings in the metal bars allow bats to fly through when they return to the cave each fall. Then as the weather turns, the gate prevents unwanted human visitors because explorers in a cave in winter, no matter how quiet they are, could wake bats from hibernation, causing them to use up weeks worth of stored energy. And that means they might not survive until spring. In this two-part program, We'll explore both the surface and the subterranean here at Kickapoo Caverns. And we'll learn about how Mississippi Valley Conservancy and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources are working together to protect bats at this important hibernation site. Kickapoo Caverns is one of 27 nature preserves protected by Mississippi Valley Conservancy here in Wisconsin's Driftless Area. These unique properties are protected and managed to enhance biodiversity and to protect native species from the threats of development and climate change. The underground cave itself is only accessible for special summer tours while the bats are out roosting in the woodlands. Above ground, the nature preserve is open to the public year-round for hiking, hunting, birding, and snowshoeing. Visit the Mississippi Valley Conservancy website for directions and more information. The 83-acre Kickapoo Caverns property is located near the town of Wazika and is just a few miles north of the Wisconsin River. It includes one of Wisconsin's longest cave systems and is an important winter home to three different species of bats. Millions of years ago, mildly acidic groundwater dissolved away some of the dolostone bedrock to form the cave here. This special landscape, formed of soluble bedrock and characterized by caves and sinkholes, is called karst. People that inhabited this region before white settlement may have known about the cave and certainly knew about the lead deposits nearby. By the early 1800s, the cave was already known to miners digging on the bluff here. For more than a century, the cave was explored by visitors anxious for adventure, many of whom left a record in the form of a small pencil signature and a date on the cave wall. Protected from the weathering that happens above ground, parts of the cave serve as a historical register of those first explorers. It wasn't until the end of World War II that the cave was developed into a tourist attraction, and for another 70 years, guided tours were given to visitors traversing paved walkways. Today, the cave and the prairie remnant and mature oak hickory forest habitats above it have been permanently protected after being purchased by the Mississippi Valley Conservancy in 2017. The Conservancy brings unique strengths to the challenge of managing Wisconsin's bat population. It works in close partnership with the Wisconsin DNR Bat Program to understand what bats use the property and how to best manage the site for bat conservation. Very few of Wisconsin's 200 or so hibernation sites are owned by Conservancy groups. Because of this, the cave is now a safe haven for bats forever.
Many people find a close encounter with a bat to be a memorable experience. Maybe it's because bats are so secretive or so familiar to us from popular culture, and yet the real animals themselves are unfamiliar. Many people live near bats without ever realizing they're there. They might come in and roost on your porch at night, resting and digesting after gorging themselves on insects. And the only evidence of their presence is the guano or fecal pellets they leave behind that you find yourself sweeping up the next morning. Many people don't have a very comprehensive understanding of bats. They might even think of them as animals to be feared or who are a nuisance. They might wonder, why does it matter if the bats in my backyard are gone? Bats are an important and amazing group of animals. With more than 1,400 species worldwide, bats make up nearly one quarter of mammal diversity on our planet. Except for the polar regions, bats have adapted to inhabit every corner of the globe. They are a hugely diverse group of animals. They can be smaller than the palm of your hand or have up to a six foot wingspan, eating everything from fruit and nectar to insects, birds, frogs, and even blood. Worldwide, bats help to pollinate plants and spread seeds, but in agriculture, forestry, and even in human health, bats perform a crucial service, pest control worth billions of dollars. In summer, Wisconsin bats play a vital role as predators of a wide variety of night flying insects. From beetles to moths to 17 different types of mosquitoes, a single little brown bat can eat up to a thousand mosquito-sized insects in just one hour while she hunts at night. Our state's eight native bat species fall into two categories. According to how they've adapted to survive our cold winters, when their insect diet isn't available. Four species migrate someplace warmer. They include the hoary bat, silver-haired bat, eastern red bat, and evening bat. The other four seek out caves and mines for hibernation. Known as cave bats, these include the most common two species, the little brown bat and big brown bat, and the less common eastern pipistrel and northern long-eared bat. In Wisconsin, all of the cave bat species are protected by law. Bats usually have only one young each year. As with other mammals, the babies, called pups, are born alive and fed milk from their mother. Female little brown and big brown bats gather in trees, attics, barns, and bat houses each summer to give birth to their pups together. These are the bats that many of us see in our own neighborhoods. In the fall, both females and males gather at caves and mines to mate and hibernate. And little brown bats can live a long time, like this 34-year-old male we found during a winter hibernation survey in Wisconsin. But as we'll see, bats in Wisconsin are currently under threat, and we need to know all we can about them in order to know how to help them. This device is called a bat detector, and I'm securing it to this tree where it will remain for the next couple of weeks. It records the echolocation calls of bats. Now, bats are difficult animals to study. During the daytime, these tiny animals are secretive and have a colorful pelage or fur coat that allows them to blend in easily with their surroundings. For a big or little brown bat, that might be the dark brown bark of a tree or for an eastern red bat, a cluster of dried dead oak leaves, perfect camouflage from predators like hawks or raccoons. Bats are nocturnal, and when they do emerge, they fly high, far, and fast. And even I, a bat biologist, can't tell which species just swooped past. So if we want to learn about bats in the field, what do we do? Well, we can capture bats using a mist net or a type of trap called a harp trap. These devices don't harm the bat, but they do allow us to have a bat that we can handle and view up close. Then we can weigh and measure individuals, apply small metal wing bands as identifiers, or take samples of hair or skin microbes for research. Now, setting up a mist net or a harp trap is a lot of work, and there's no guarantee that I'll actually capture any bats. 
So if I just want to know who's flying around this forest at night, I could listen. Most people are familiar with echolocation, the type of sonar that bats use in which they send out sound with their mouth and listen for the echoes of that sound to bounce back to their very sensitive ears. Bats hear what you and I can only see. They literally hear the trees. Of course, echolocation calls occur at extremely high frequency, well above the range of human hearing. The bat detector records those calls, and back at our office, we can use a computer software program to translate those calls into a sonogram or a picture of the sound. Then we can compare the recorded sonograms to known species calls and determine which species were foraging in this forest. By doing this type of monitoring at Kickapoo Caverns, we know that bats use this property for more than just winter cave hibernation. By recording the echolocation calls above ground, we've found that migratory hoary bats and eastern red bats, in addition to little browns and big browns, forage for insects here in the summer. Here's what the bat detector recorded at Kickapoo Caverns. But what brings bats to this property in the first place? There are many unknowns about the lives of bats. While we might find the beauty and the history of the cave intriguing, it's likely the location of this cave in close proximity to a river valley that helps guide bats here each fall. And they can travel far in summer, up to 290 miles away from this place to forage in your neighborhood and sleep in the bat house in your backyard. When bats do arrive here, they spend time in this forest, storing up fat. Then they're ready to mate, and throughout the fall, they'll use the cave entrance here at night for an activity known as swarming, flying in and out of the cave, along with other bats that are just returning to the area. And while this swarming behavior characterizes their mating season, female bats won't actually become pregnant until six or seven months later, when they leave the cave in spring to return to their summer roosts. Our efforts to learn about bats are more critical now than ever because a disease is threatening North American bats. It's called white nose syndrome. While it doesn't pose a threat to humans, white nose syndrome is caused by a fungus that thrives in caves and grows into the skin of bats while they hibernate, damaging their wings. The fungus causes them to burn through their precious stored fat reserves very quickly and kills them off underground or leads them to die of exposure when they exit the cave into the freezing surface temperatures in search of insects. Originating in Europe and later introduced to North America on the East Coast, White Nose Syndrome reached Wisconsin in 2014 and is now present in all caves and mines in the state. And most cave populations have seen die-offs of 95 to 99% of their hibernating bat population. Now exactly how the fungus moved from Europe to North America remains an unknown. But we do know that humans can potentially move the fungus on their clothing and gear thereby transmitting the disease from cave to cave. And as a biologist, I visit a lot of caves, so I have to be really careful to properly decontaminate my gear. There are a few bats persisting in Wisconsin caves and mines despite the presence of the fungus. Kickapoo Caverns is one of those important sites, and whether it's because of those individuals' genetics, physiology, behavior, or differences in their hibernation environments, we don't know yet. But because they're still here in winter, those individuals are incredibly important to biologists like me. As biologists and researchers, we still have a long way to go in our understanding of white nose syndrome and bat conservation. But partnerships with groups like Mississippi Valley Conservancy allow us to keep pursuing answers to our questions. 
And while we're waiting for the scientific process to unfold, here are some ways that you can help bats. Control invasive plant species. Bats eat a wide variety of insects and need a diverse diet. Invasive plants crowd out our native wildflowers. In order to support a wide variety of insects, we need to have a wide variety of native plants for them to feed on. Keep out of caves in winter. Bats are extremely sensitive to disturbance and if woken up from hibernation, burn through 30 to 60 days worth of stored fat reserves. Bats sick with white nose syndrome are already waking up too many times because of the fungal disease and may not be able to handle any extra periods of energy use. If you want to visit a cave, go in summer when bats aren't home. If you do visit a cave, make sure you pay attention to your clothing, footwear, and gear. You'll need to appropriately clean and decontaminate it before you take it on to another cave. And make sure you're not responsible for spreading the white-nose syndrome fungus. It's always a good idea to put up a bat house to give mother bats a place to birth their pups in summer. Whether you build it or buy one, be sure to check out the Wisconsin DNR's website for guidance on the size of the house and where to put it so that you're certain it will be useful to our native bat species. With bat houses, it's all about location. You'll have the greatest chance of getting bats to move in if you live relatively close to a body of water. Put the bat house up facing full sun, at least eight feet in the air, and in an undisturbed location. Mounted on a post or a building, but never on a tree. Look for guano pellets to appear below the roost to learn if bats are using it. Count and report your bat roost. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources collects information on roosts that helps inform how we help bats in our state. Knowing where bats are and how they're doing may even help DNR biologists deliver treatments for white nose syndrome, like vaccines, to help bats survive. Visit the DNR website and search bats for more information or to report your roost. Finally, be a bat champion. Learn and share. Join the community of bat caretakers. Learn about bats and their value and share what you know with others. Visit the whitenosesyndrome.org website for more information. Bats really do need all of us to be aware of their plight, especially those of us who like to visit caves and mines. And in the next installment of this series, I'll take you deep underground to see the place where bats hibernate here and explore the timeless beauty of Kickapoo Caverns. We thank Jennifer Riddell of the Wisconsin DNR for sharing her expertise to help us protect and manage the caves at Kickapoo Caverns for Wisconsin's bat population. You'll find more about this special place and all the public nature preserves of our community-supported organization at mississippivalleyconservancy.org. Thanks for watching this Link to the Land tour. We hope to see you on the trail again soon. Thank you.